Siegfried Fischbacher and Roy Horn met on a German cruise ship back in the 60s. Siegfried was a first-class steward by day and a magician by night, and on the other hand, Roy had abandoned school and was working as a bellboy. The latter was a lover of wild animals, and his first words to Siegfried were ones of challenging him to consider using cheetahs in his acts instead of the usual rabbits. Surprisingly, Siegfried was up for the challenge, but what he wasn't prepared for was for Roy to introduce him to a cheetah aboard the ship. It was then that their long-term friendship was brewed and the two decided to merge Siegfried's magic tricks with Roy's undying love for animals, forging what turned out to be a dynamic duo of entertainers that took the world by storm. The duo's first show was aboard the T.S. Bruman, and as expected, the captain of the ship was not pleased that young Roy had smuggled a cheetah into the ship. However, their show was received well by the audience and went on without a hitch, marking the beginning of their rise to fame. As they performed across cities, they grew an unbreakable bond whereby Siegfried was the mastermind of the tricks and illusions, while Roy was the animal whisperer on a constant mission to elevate their acts. Their roles seemed to intertwine seamlessly, making the performance one of a kind. Their chemistry on stage was undeniable as they often compensated for each other's weaknesses and without one, the other was not enough. They garnered a great following in Europe before bringing their shows to the major resort city of Las Vegas. As the years went by, they continued to perfect their art, pushed boundaries, and exceeded expectations, leaving their audiences yearning for more. Their shows always included daring to share the stage with the rarest and most beautiful wild animals from large elephants to white lions and tigers, a stunt that saw them quickly rise to fame and for decades they were the talk of the city. Every show they would schedule sold out in minutes and thousands would flock to the small venues which often made the duo feel restricted. Thankfully, Steve Wynn, a wealthy man, saw through their plight and began the construction of the first new hotel casino, the Mirage Resort and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip, with the duo in mind. He built them a 1500 capacity, $30 million theater, a giant stage enough to accommodate a mechanical dragon, and a two-bedroom apartment within the hotel, with his main demand being that the duo would only perform their never-seen-before shows at that venue only. The deal was signed, and as soon as the hotel's doors opened, their first show there was met with immediate success. For years, Siegfried and Roy performed countless times at the Mirage, and as always, thousands would converge to watch them. The pair made sure not to disappoint their audience and went all out in the rehearsals and eventual shows. Their creative genius shined in every aspect of their entertainment acts and with every successful show, it was clear that they were fearless in their pursuit of perfection and relentlessly propelled themselves to new heights of excellence. Their performances were so captivating that the audiences would often forget that they were in close proximity to a parade of unchained wild animals capable of ending their lives in an instant. They were at the peak of their careers and it felt like the flashy duo, being magicians, had woven a spell around their audience, captivating them with their charisma and talent. As masters of their craft, they were able to effortlessly command the stage and draw the attention of their audience with every move, word, and gesture. To say the least, their performances were electric, leaving audiences bound by the spell and craving for more. They also had a way of connecting deeply with their fans, forging an emotional bond that lasted long after the light of the stage had gone out and the curtains closed. By the mid-90s, the iconic duo had an incredible collection of big cats and exotic pets, which stayed in the sanctuaries they had created and the properties they had acquired. Among them was Manacor, a white tiger. Manacor was born in Mexico, but when his mother rejected him, the duo took him in and hand-raised him. When he was six months old, Roy began training him and slowly introducing him to the shows. Within no time, Manicor had mastered the performance and had become a star of the show, performing night after night alongside Roy. He was adored by the crowd, whom he was often eager to please. In 2003, Siegfried and Roy began preparing to perform what they described as their biggest show yet. They were looking forward to celebrating 44 years of success together and Roy's 59th birthday. The date was October 3rd, 2003. Save for a spotlight focus on the center stage, 
The theater was dark, and the audience was a sea of eager faces with eyes shining in anticipation and bodies poised with excitement. Every rustle of clothing or snack bag, a murmur of conversation, cough, or sneeze was met with a stem hush as all eyes focused on the stage. As the curtains rose and the shadows of Roy and Manacor peeped through the stage, the audience stood on their feet and erupted in thunderous applause, their cheers resonating through the entire theater as they welcomed them to the stage. As the two came under the spotlight, Manacor's gleaming white fur was both striking and ethereal. As he moved, his muscles rippled beneath his snowy coat, giving him an air of effortless strength and grace. The audience was in awe. Roy acknowledged the warm welcome of his audience and was ready to give them the show of their lifetime. Unfortunately, it was never to be. 45 seconds into the show, before the audience was completely settled down, the unexpected happened. During the thousands of times they had been on the stage together, Roy and Manicor followed a strict routine that involved Roy walking the tiger in a circle before stopping and getting down on the floor to lower his microphone on the seven-year-old tiger's mouth for him to say hello to the crowd. However, before they could get to that point, Manicor wandered off his mark. Roy tried to guide him back, but instead of moving in a circle, he steered him with his hand, accidentally shoving him, thereby breaking their routine, which ended up being a crucial mistake. Manicor was confused and irritated which stirred the rebellion in him. His ears and whiskers perked and his eyes turned into a warning shade of green. Out of the blue, Manicor grabbed Roy by his sleeve, sinking his sharp teeth into his arm. Roy was caught by surprise, but tried to remain calm, repeatedly asking the tire to let go of him. Lawrence, a trainer on standby, who had worked with the duo for a long time, quickly noticed a mishap and tried to entice Manicor with raw meat from backstage so that he could let go of Roy. However, that did not work. Roy was left with no choice but to hit the tiger on its head with a microphone until it let him go. He felt a bit of relief, but the ordeal was far from over. Manicor swiped at his feet, knocking him to the ground. Roy groaned in pain as his face hit the floor. The audience was still fixated on them, waiting for what they thought was the next part of the performance. Manicor pounced on Roy, who was stiff on the ground, and proceeded to grab him by the neck. Its sharp teeth pierced through the flesh, crushing his windpipe and severing a major artery. The crowd gasped as blood spurted all around, painting the stage floor red, a gory sight that sent chills down their spine and quickened their pulse. As if suddenly realizing that their safety had been an illusion all along, and for the first time noticing that there was no barrier between them and the fierce tiger, Chaos erupted as everyone scrambled their way to the nearest exit. Halfway to the cage, the trainers tried to give commands to the ever-obedient tiger, but it wouldn't respond to any of them. Roy was losing blood fast, and they had to do something to get him off the powerful jaws of the tiger. A four-man crew used a fire extinguisher and sprayed the tiger, but that too did not work. But after repeatedly hitting its head with the butt of the extinguisher, it finally dropped Roy who was in respiratory distress and in such a critical state that all the crew could do was wait for the paramedics to arrive. Amidst the pain and agony, Roy instructed the crew not to put down Manicor because he believed that he was still a good tiger and was not to be blamed. Moments later, Roy was wheeled out of the venue and rushed to a nearby hospital. Due to the severity of his injuries and celebrity status, the surgeons had to be alerted of his arrival beforehand. After several surgeries, Roy miraculously survived, but was left partially paralyzed with difficulty in talking and walking. Following the attack, the Mirage was forced to close the show, leaving many people jobless and with endless questions. Siegfried and Roy's last show ended up being an unforgettable one, but not in the way they had envisioned. <laughs>